Welcome to What's New in Python 3.11. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide to the improvements in the Python 3.11 release. The course title says it all, but what's that include? You'll be learning about how the 1.2 speedup was achieved, new, more precise messaging in tracebacks, the addition of TOML to the standard library, and new features with exceptions and the new task group mechanism. Python is on an annual release schedule, with releases usually coming early in October. The 3.11 release took a few weeks longer, but was worth waiting for. A big chunk of the effort in this release is under the covers as part of the ongoing speed improvements to the CPython interpreter. They've achieved an average speed up of 1.2 times in each of the benchmark scripts versus the 3.10 performance, which itself had significant improvements. The introduction of the peg parser in Python 3.9 has allowed improvements in the error messages you see when something goes wrong. Python 3.11 continues along this path with more fine-grained information in the traceback output. TOML is a popular configuration format in the Python world and is used by a lot of packaging tools. It has been promoted to a first-class citizen by being included in the standard library. There have also been some improvements to exceptions. First, you can now group exceptions together, and second, you can add clarifying notes to exceptions as well. If you use the async I.O. parallel computation module, you'll find a new addition called the task group. This is a new way of invoking your async functions inside of a context manager, and it takes advantage of the new exception group mechanism when something goes wrong. There are also several new additions to type hint capabilities. The self type annotates the use of a class within its methods. Variadic types allow for the declaration of tuples of varying length, and a new decorator tells type systems that a class conforms to data class semantics. Next up, I'll dive into all the speedy new things that Python does speedily. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll be talking about the things that have changed in Python 3.11 to make it faster. CPython is currently undergoing a multi-release project that focuses on speeding up the interpreter. The improvements in 3.11 are quite significant, with the average speed in Python's benchmark suite being a little over 1.2 times faster. As with all speed changes, you may or may not notice the differences depending on your use cases. Let's take a look at how some of this speed was achieved. PEP659 proposed a specializing adaptive interpreter. Just what does that mean? Well, it means that the interpreter is now dynamically adapting the instructions based on the code that is being run. The proposal states that the intent is to specialize the code aggressively over a small region. Python is an interpreted language. Your script gets compiled into bytecode, which is executed by a runtime. This is distinct from a purely compiled language where the program is compiled into machine language. The advantage of an interpreted language is that it can be run on any platform where there is a runtime implemented, whereas a purely compiled language needs to be compiled specifically to a platform. This is also why purely compiled languages tend to be faster than interpreted ones. There's one less level of indirection. What PEP659 proposed is having the interpreter watch what is being executed and modifying the bytecode on the fly, optimizing the choices. Consider, for example, the bytecode operation load adder, which is responsible for loading attributes. It can be replaced with load adder adaptive. The interpreter then watches what is being loaded and replaces the adaptive call with a more specific call. This examination of the attribute being loaded might discover that it's loading an instance value, or loading something from a module, or loading something from a class's slot. This kind of optimization is only done for code that is called repeatedly and typically gets triggered in loops. As programs can spend a lot of time in loops, this can make a difference in the execution time of that same loop. Let's go take a look at this in practice. I'm inside of the Python 3.11 REPL, and I'm going to write a small function that converts between the imperial measurement of feet and the metric measurement of meters. Nothing complicated here. 
there are roughly three feet in a meter, this multiplication does the exact conversion. Now I'm going to run this in a loop seven times. And there's the result. The dis module allows you to disassemble Python code and look at the corresponding bytecode generated by the compiler. Using the dis function in the dis module, I can see what is involved in the function I just called. I'm far from an expert in the underlying interpreter, but you get the general idea of what's going on. A constant and a variable are loaded, and a multiplication operation is called on them. The result is then returned. Now, let me do one more conversion. This is similar to what I was doing in the loop above. Let's look at dis again. Notice that it has changed. The adaptive interpreter mechanism has seen that the operation is between two floats and changed the code to be float multiplication specific. Your computer has specialized hardware for doing floating point calculations, and I'm guessing that this specialty operation takes advantage of that, improving your speed. Future calls to feet to meters should be faster. You may be wondering why it decided to change things when it did. The adaptive mechanism triggers after repeated use of the same code. For this case, it clicked in on the eighth execution. So on the eighth call to the function, the byte code was adapted. A variety of byte calls have been adjusted to be adaptive, and more may get added in the future. Another optimization is in the performance of code in try accept blocks. This change reduces the amount of overhead in the case where an exception doesn't fire. Java and C++ have similar mechanisms. Good artists copy, great artists steal. The underlying compiler now is generating a table for all the code blocks inside of try except situations. That table contains references to the code to be run if an exception fires. Previously, this was done explicitly in the stack, and work was done for each try except case. Using the table method, there is almost no work to be done if the exception doesn't fire. This doesn't mean that exceptions are free, they still have overhead to handle them. But, as you generally code exceptions to be outside the happy path, this could mean a performance improvement for you. Before this improvement, there was some memory overhead attached to each function call that is now no longer necessary. Removing it may cause some speed up for function calls as a nice side effect. Remember all that bytecode stuff I was just talking about? Well, creating it takes effort, so Python caches the results in a Dunder PyCache directory. That means if you run a script a second time without making any changes, the interpreter can skip the compilation step. The typical process when running a script that has contents in Dunder PyCache is to read the cache, unmarshal the objects, that means to deserialize them from their disk format into their memory format, and allocate memory on the heap for the objects and the code before executing the code. Certain modules in the interpreter are frozen. This means they are put into a state where most of these steps can be skipped. What Python 3.11 is doing is freezing more of the key modules. This freezing process means the code is statically allocated, resulting in the ability to load it directly, essentially combining those first three steps into one operation. This change has resulted in a 10-15% to 15 improvement in interpreter loading times. This can be a big difference for small scripts, as Python's startup is relatively expensive. For smaller scripts, a big chunk of execution time is the startup cost. A 10-15% to 15 improvement in startup might mean a 10% improvement in your shorter scripts. But wait, there's more, trademark into. There have been some improvements in how the frame that describes a function is created, as well as some other optimizations. Recursive calls are now more efficient. 
The method that translates ASCII into Unicode is now order and execution. The COMB and PERM functions in MathLib have been improved. And some optimizations have been done for regular expressions. Well, that was fast. S see what I did there? Next up, how tracebacks give finer grained information when something goes wrong. In the previous lesson, I talked about some of the speed improvements in Python 3.11. In this lesson, I'll show you how tracebacks have become more descriptive. The changes described in this lesson are based on PEP 657, called Include Fine Grained Error Locations in Tracebacks. Python 3.9 changed the underlying parser in CPython, which has enabled some interesting changes in error messages. Some of my favorite improvements in Python 3.10 were in the errors, and Python 3.11 continues on this path. Traceback output from exceptions now have additional information pointing to the source of the problem. Let's go look at some examples. To look at the errors, first I'm going to need some code with problems in it. This script takes some data in dictionary format and populates a person object with it. It's a bit of a simplification, but this kind of code is common when, say, deserializing JSON. Instead of JSON, though, I'm starting with a hard-coded list of dictionaries. Each item in the list is a dictionary itself containing name, date of birth, and date of death data. Some of the items are missing data. This is where the errors are going to come from. Let me just scroll down here. The data is to be converted into a person object. The person is based on a named tuple and contains a string field for their name and a tuple for their birth and death dates. The dict to person utility function constructs a new person object based on a dictionary passed in. And the convert pair function which I'll admit is a bit of a contrived example, converts two at a time. I foresee twice the failure in my future. Okay, let's go break some things. To see the improvements, I'm going to run the previous script in both Python 3.10 and 3.11. I'll start with 3.10 in the top window here. I've used the dash i argument to Python which loads the script and then kicks you into a REPL. Remember that the script only defined the data and functions. It didn't run anything. I'll be doing that in the REPL. Here, I've started by converting my first scientist. So far, so good. Dictionary in, person out. For the second scientist, I'll be using Euclid who has some information missing. When I try to convert Euclid, I get an exception and a traceback printed out as a result. The traceback tells me the failure was a key error and happened on line 37 in the dict to person function. It also shows me line 37, which is an F string where the key last was used but unavailable. In the bottom window, I'm going to run the same script, this time with Python 3.11. Same dash i flag. Same happy case. Same Euclid. And the same error, but this time with more information. The squiggly line made up of the tilde character is new. It shows the dictionary where the key error happened, while the line of up arrows, or carrots, shows the problematic key. Handy, huh? Not earth-shattering, but sometimes the simple things can make your life easier. Okay, back to Python 3.10. Let's break something else. New scientist. This one having the right key, but a none value. and you get a different kind of exception. This time it's a type error. Let's see this in Python 3.11. Nazar again. And once again, the error is annotated with the two funky lines. 
showing the dictionary and the specific item in the dictionary that caused the problem. All right, back to 310 for another go. And here's a case where these indicators become really helpful. In Python 3.10, there was no way of knowing which of the two references to year in line 38 caused the problem. In Python 3.11, this is made clear with the squiggly lines. All right, it's time to double down. Here, I've used the convert pair function that converts two scientists at a time. When I use bad data, it gets pretty hard to know what's going on. Which call to the function caused the problem? I'm sure you're way ahead of me at this point, but here's the Python 3.11 version. Not only does the error in line 38 get annotated, but so does the source of the error in line 44. You can now see which of the two calls broke, which gives you insight into which piece of data is problematic. Enough errors for now. More to come later. Next up, I'll show you TOML, the configuration language which is now part of the standard library.